Hi, everyone. This is uh, Dr. Sashik Patel. Um, I'm the uh, Director of Pediatric Transplant at the University of Nebraska Medical Center and Children's Hospital and Medical Center. Um, I welcome all of you on this uh, Saturday to a wonderful session um, entitled Late Effects of Pediatric Transplant, uh, Transitioning uh, Pediatrics to Adult Care. Um, I'd like to introduce a wonderful physician in uh, St. Louis uh, by the name of Dr. Robert Hayashi. Uh, Dr. Hayashi is a professor of pediatrics in the Division of Pediatric Hematology Oncology at Washington University School of Medicine and an attending physician at St. Louis Children's uh, Hospital in St. Louis, Missouri. He is also the director of late effects of the late effects clinic at St. Louis Children's Hospital. Uh, his research focuses primarily on the lo uh, long-term effects of cancer therapy, and he is involved in regional and national efforts to better understand the late effects uh, with a, the goal of de uh, developing interventions that will improve the outlook uh, for this patient population. Please join us uh, in welcoming Dr. Hayashi. Thank you, Dr. Patel. Um, I would like to take this opportunity to uh, thank the organizers of this uh, symposium and uh, for the invitation to speak today. And hopefully I'll be able to provide you with information that will be useful for all of you. So pediatric uh, hematopoietic stem cell transplant or bone marrow transplant, uh, as you all know, is increasing in its use um, in this country. And there are now probably over 3,000 procedures performed uh, in this country per year, and that is expected to grow with time. Transplants were originally used to treat cancer, uh, uh, for instance, leukemia, lymphoma, or, or solid tumors like neuroblastoma, but with advancing technologies, it is now uh, feasible to utilize this modality to virtually cure any primary disease of the blood, and that includes immunodeficiencies, sickle cell anemia, metabolic diseases like Hurley's disease. So we expect that uh, more and more patients will utilize this technology. As, uh, as pediatric uh, patients who are undergoing this procedure, they're obviously expected to not only be cured of their underlying condition, but they're also expected to live many years well into adulthood after the transplant procedure. And during this time, we expect these children to grow substantially as they move into adulthood. They will obviously grow in size. Their organs and bones will also grow. And, but not only the physical, but their intellect will also grow as they advance in terms of their uh, intellectual function, advancing through their educational um, <clears throat> um, process. And so the transplant procedure, however, can interfere with the normal growth of any of these aspects. And so it's important to have an appreciation of exactly how this can potentially impact uh, a patient so that we can best manage their situation. So this is a summary of the topics I hope to cover today. We're going to talk about some basic principles so that we can get our arms around exactly how to think about um, a child who's undergone a transplant procedure as we look toward the future. I'll provide some specific examples which may be relevant to some of you out there who have ex undergone a transplant uh, procedure, uh, but just to kind of give you a sense of the scope, but also the complexity and how we approach the management of these patients, which can be very different depending upon what kind of problem we're talking about. I will emphasize the importance of something that's called a treatment summary and the, the necessity of having one that you build throughout your lifetime. Um, I will specifically uh, address uh, issues as it relates to monitoring growth, because again, as children, uh, we expect these children to grow and we need to monitor all aspects of growth to provide the best possible care for our patients. And then finally, the ultimate goal is to um, help uh, a child ultimately achieve a state of independence where they're fully grown adults, they're in, well integrated in society and can continue to meet the challenges that they face um, independently if needed. So starting at the beginning, <clears throat> just wanna kind of get some definitions um, clarified. We define late effects very broadly. 
it's really any long-term difficulty experienced by a child from the transplant procedure. This can be physical or damage to a specific organ. This can be intellectual, as I mentioned, and obviously this um, can affect school performance, but it also can be emotional. Uh, we can have uh, children experience difficulties either from the transplant procedure or from some of the late effects they experience. And irrespective of what the nature of the late effects is, if it's impacting the child, it's important and it, it needs to be addressed seriously. The, the other point to make about late effects is that the research in this area is relatively new. We needed to have successful transplant procedures and we needed time to pass by before we could actually see the effects of transplantation on uh, children as they grew uh, many years and uh, moved into adulthood. And so this is really a field that continues to grow, it continues to evolve. We, we, even as clinicians and researchers, continue to learn new things every day. And so for a patient or a family member, it's really important to stay current because things you have, may have learned um, years ago may not be relevant today or may be approached totally different. And it's, and it's important to provide the best care possible by keeping up to date with what's with, with what is going on. Uh, every component of the transplant can have an effect. So obviously chemotherapy, particularly with transplant procedures and their intensity uh, can cause uh, a variety of uh, uh, effects on the child. Uh, radiation, uh, not surprisingly, can have long lasting effects on a, on a child. But also some of the medications that we use to support the children in uh, transplantation. Uh, steroids uh, can have their effects. Some of the immunosuppressant agents, um, such as tacrolimus or cyclosporin, uh, beyond just affecting their ability to fight infections, they can cause uh, long-term uh, injury and that has to be managed. Any illness through the transplant course can obviously sustain itself over time. If a child got a serious infection during um, the transplant procedure or had uh, something to affect their liver, like xenoclusive disease, some of those things may persist as persistent problems well after the transplant uh, procedure has uh, passed. And then the transplant procedure is not a perfect uh, technology. Uh, there are some aspects of diseases that children may have that may continue irrespective of whether the transplant procedure were, um, was successful or not. Examples are children with Hurler's disease who may continue to have bone problems, uh, problems with their back, uh, patients with adrenal leukodystrophy who may have had uh, permanent damage to their adrenal glands and will have continued adrenal insufficiency long after the transplant procedure. And then uh, patients who had receive previous treatment uh, for their condition, like for instance, cancer patients who receive treatment prior to the transplant procedure, those treatments in and of themselves may have caused problems and obviously need to be taken into account if you're gonna provide a total picture in terms of the management of the patient. So obviously the way I've summarized these things, it's very clear that the management of the transplant after the transplant can be very complicated. Some parts um, of the transplant procedure may have what we call additive effects or, or kind of gang up on specific organs or conditions and make the problem worse. For instance, radiation can have effects on the heart as well as uh, chemotherapy. And so those things can may, may be add together in very unpredictable ways. And so we need to really take all the information we have both regarding past treatments leading up to the transplant, the transplant procedure, any treatments that were provided after the transplant procedure to really provide a total picture to provide the most comprehensive management of, of patients moving forward. So let me give, uh, give you a few specific examples, just giving you a sense of the nature of problems that some patients may have. And some of you who may have undergone a transplant procedure may 
have either experienced something like this or may be undergoing evaluations for this. But um, this is really to hopefully give you a better sense of uh, the nature and scope of the problems that we're talking about. So a very common late effects is, is the thyroid disease. So the thyroid is an organ that sits in the middle of your neck, and its <clears throat> primary function is to regulate the energy of the, of the body. Um, radiation, if you receive radiation as part of your, your transplant procedure, that can cause uh, some level of damage. But it can also alter the genes of that thyroid and potentially cause cancer. So there's potentially two problems with it with um, the thyroid either being damaged or becoming a, uh, a, a cancer with time. The organ uh, uh, can swell and get big, that's called a goiter, and it may lose its function. And so some of the signs that your thyroid may not be working well is that you seem to be more fatigued or sleeping all the time, your hair may be thinning, uh, you may be retaining weight or getting puffy in funny ways that are kind of difficult to explain. And unfortunately, like many late effects, thyroid disease can often take years to develop. And so it can sneak on very gradually. You may not notice it coming, and then all of a sudden you have these symptoms, and it's a consequence of this. And, and obviously, some of these symptoms um, are not obvious in terms of how you put this together in terms of one um, condition. Uh, so to, to manage patients with who are at risk for thyroid disease, they really need to have tests of their thyroid function, which is a blood test, um, and that should be done yearly for all intents and purposes for the rest of the person's life because the thyroid can fail at any point in time, even 10, 15, 20 years later. And so, and the other um, uh, important element is that the thyroid needs to be examined by a uh, care provider who's familiar with um, knowing what a normal thyroid looks like, what um, what it feels like, uh, how to detect nodules or bumps that may be cancer cells um, so that we can address those conditions as quickly as possible. So this is just an example of how we approach a condition like thyroid disease. Uh, another uh, scope of late effects can be manifested by patients who've received steroids and because steroids are a very important part of graft-versus-host disease, many patients who've undergone transplantation have been exposed to steroids. And um, probably most of you are familiar with some of the common side effects of steroids. They can cause diabetes. They can make you put on a lot of weight. Um, they can give you a persistently high blood pressure. But over time, particularly if you have to stay on uh, steroid therapy for a long period of time for, let's say, graft-versus-host disease, um, this can have a long-term and potentially permanent impact on the bone. This can make them thin, not as strong, and that can lead to chronic breaks, which obviously can not just alter your function, but can be a source of pain. They can also alter the blood supply to joints and causing um, failures of like the hip joints or virtually any joint in the body. And some of those uh, problems may have require surgery like hip replacements in order to fix those things. Um, and, uh, and so in order to, to really manage the bone problems, which is one of the most uh, pressing issues for uh, steroids and long-term effects, um, you, you need to stay on top of how the bone health is, and that's usually done by bone density tests, which can be done in most hospitals and, um, and can give you a sense of whether uh, your bones are weakening. Things that you can do um, to maintain your health are to uh, obviously take calcium and, and make sure that you're getting a good source of vitamin D because that will help uh, put uh, uh, calcium back into the bones and make the bones stronger. And exercise is a very important uh, part of management in terms of patients who are exposed to steroids. You want to keep your weight down so you don't put undue stress on your joints. Uh, but also, as you exercise, you actually promote um, uh, calcium uh, buildup in your bones and makes them stronger, particularly if you're doing resistance exercises like mild weightlifting or things like that. So that's, that's very important to keep in mind. Moving on to something totally different uh, is school performance. Um, many children can have difficulties with uh, their school work after transplant, and that can be a, a 
uh, a product of many things that can affect intellectual development. The radiation can have effects on the brain uh, as well as the chemotherapy. Past cancer therapies could have effects as well. And also, if, if a patient experienced some complication of the transplant that led to potentially um, injury to the brain, like uh, having seizures or strokes, that will further build on potential uh, things that will impact the child's development. So the ch children will often show these problems by not, not doing well in school, particularly not performing as, they, as well as they had when they were uh, uh, prior to the transplant procedure. And as the, they advance through grades, um, the work gets harder and their um, struggles with schools may be, may be even getting worse with time. And so you can have a child who may be doing well in early grades, but as they are challenged to do more uh, difficulties, um, then um, they may have uh, failing grades when they never had problems with grades before. It's very hard for us to predict how a child is going to do until they're challenged intellectually. So for instance, if you're in first grade, you're not going to know whether you're going to have difficulties with calculus in the future until you reach high school or college and take calculus and realize that, that the transplant had that specific effect on your brain so that, that made it a diff, more difficult um, area of study than perhaps others. So the only way we can really get a handle on what an individual child's problem may be uh, um, may entail is by doing what is called neuropsychological testing. And so this basically is a, a process in which uh, all aspects of a child's intellectual function is assessed. Uh, they can be very long tests. Sometimes they can take several hours. Uh, they also test memory, which is very important. You may see some children after the transplant not have as good a memory for things uh, as they used to. And so we um, uh, use this tool so that we can get a good profile of the difficulties a child may be experiencing, and then we can assist families in terms of ensuring that they get the services to accommodate those particular weaknesses. Most states uh, mandate this by law, and so if you have documentation that a child's having uh, difficulties in school as uh, reflected in their neural psychological testing, um, the neuropsychologist will provide specific recommendations to allow the child to maximize their school performance, and uh, schools are, are in general um, obligated to fulfill those uh, responsibilities. And so we encourage families to um, do neuropsychological testing early, and typically we often repeat it about every three years. It's better not to wait until problems um, uh, develop because they can be more difficult to um, uh, to manage. But most importantly, it's very important that that a clear profile is uh, identified before a child grows up and advances into college. Because many times, if you haven't established that there are problems earlier in their educational uh, process and already have implemented services sometimes colleges will not be as accommodating with the lack of documentation and the, the necessity demonstrated in early school years that a child needs. So um, uh, any child who's at risk for intellectual difficulties, we would encourage neuropsychological testing and something to make it a regular part of their evaluation. <clears throat> Another area that's very important to uh, patients and families is fertility. Uh, the transplant procedures have different effects on uh, fertility. You may be familiar that there are transplant procedures that are called myeloablative uh, procedures, and typically those are often associated with high rates of infertility, where you may have other uh, children who may undergo what are called non-myeloablative procedures, and so then there's a greater potential to, um, to have children as uh, once they reach adulthood. And so... <clears throat> Um, it's very difficult to specifically um, quantitate a particular child's um, fertility risk, even um, if you know exactly how they were treated. And so we make uh, specific recommendations for 
um, children and families who are being evaluated for the uh, transplantation even prior to the procedure. Um, there, it's best um, to have these discussions and undergoing plan to perhaps uh, have backups to preserve fertility. Uh, sperm banking is readily available uh, for many families as well as egg harvesting and having those uh, secured prior to the transplant procedure at least ensures that you have options to have uh, children in the future, all, you know, well, um, irrespective of what happens uh, during the transplant. After the transplant, it's still important to assess a patient's fertility potential. You shouldn't necessarily be fatalistic and say there's no chance of having children. It's important to get evaluations, get uh, opinions, and perhaps undergo testing like sperm counts or what is called an AMH level, which gives you a sense of how the ovaries are working. And then if, in fact, uh, there is the potential to uh, to have um, sustained fertility, we recommend serious consideration of doing something early because uh, oftentimes over time, over the years, a person's fertility can decline with age. And so you may not have the same fertility potential when you're ready to have children than perhaps you did earlier after, uh, more immediately after the transplant procedure. And so these are kind of discussions that we encourage families and patients to have um, because we don't want them to wait too long and, and the opportunity is lost. Um, these uh, uh, resources are often not covered by insurance companies, uh, although some uh, insurance companies do, so cost becomes an issue. Um, there are resources that, some, uh, that are available that can assist with uh, providing um, financial assistance, and, and those discussions are obviously uh, important to ensure that uh, you have every opportunity available um, to uh, maintain uh, uh, the ability to have children in the future. <clears throat> uh, sexual development is, a, is different from just fertility. It really pertains to how a child uh, advances through puberty and how they maintain their, their sexual function. Um, there, the, um, there are actually different parts of the ovaries and testes that are responsible for sexual development versus fertility. So it's conceivable that you can have a loss in fertility and have normal puberty or, or at least much more sustained puberty. So you shouldn't make assumptions of one versus the other depending upon whether you're having difficulties with either fertility or puberty. Um, experience, uh, uh, providers will know that if a patient's not advancing through puberty, that that's obviously a red flag. And so obviously you need to uh, maintain uh, normal follow-up with either your pediatrician or your uh, physician who's overseeing the late effects of your child to make sure that um, they're advancing um, along a normal pace that you would expect for a child advancing through puberty if they receive their transplant procedure at an early age because there are certain um, interventions that can be implemented if we see that the child is having problems. And many of those are hormone supplementations, but um, a, um, uh, oftentimes there are certain windows um, in which to gain the full benefit of these treatments, you need to recognize them relatively early. So it's, it's something that should be a, a regular part of normal medical management and um, and so that uh, efforts can be made to make the situation as, as easy as possible. And further on, some children or uh, young adult uh, uh, transplant survivors may lose that function. They may go into early uh, menopause or experience low testosterone and hormone supplementation in, in those settings are also very important. And so, um, just like thyroid disease, this is something that needs to be followed indefinitely for a patient so that we can provide appropriate services when, if, when and if a patient's having difficulty. Uh, emotional health, as I had mentioned before, uh, is just as important as any difficulties that you may be having with a particular organ that uh, got uh, impacted by the transplant procedure. Um, 
as many of you know, the transplant procedure has the potential to potent to alter uh, aspects of a person's physical appearance. Um, some patients end up shorter than they were projected to be. Some patients who may have graphosis may undergo permanent skin changes that um, persist. Uh, some patients may have chronic hair loss that doesn't grow back. Uh, so body image beca becomes a uh, the potential has the potential of uh, uh, creating a significant burden on the uh, on the patient, and it's not surprising that over time that can actually uh, significantly impact a person's emotional health, uh, particularly a, in a growing child who's in school, particularly as they advance in the teenage years, peer acceptance becomes can potentially become a, a challenge, and and not just from the physical appearance, but also the emotional uh, development. Many uh, survivors tell me that uh, their perspective on life, having experienced a potential life-threatening condition, is very different than the average um, uh, young child or adolescent who may have a more carefree approach because they haven't had the same life experiences. And that um, asynchrony in terms of uh, emotions, perspective, can uh, make it difficult to develop uh, strong relationships, have um, uh, normal friendships, et cetera. And so um, it's not uh, unusual for patients to need some assistance and counseling to try to get through some of these hurdles. And then there can be persistent physical uh, limitations, and particularly chronic pain. If you're experiencing chronic pain, either from a damaged joint or, or something else, uh, that can obviously impact your emotional health, and oftentimes that requires um, uh, assistance. Um, I think the, probably the most important thing is to acknowledge the fact that these things can happen, that there are things that are really not um, a child's fault, that they, it was a consequence of the therapy, so that you can move forward to find solutions and, and provide um, uh, 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 therapies that can make the uh, child have a more um, healthy uh, future moving forward. The, um, uh, so let me, having given all those examples, I want to uh, stress the importance of what we refer to as the treatment summary. So the treatment summary is a record of all the complex medical information in the patient's history. And that's um, not just the transplant procedure, but any pre-existing therapy, any pre-existing health problems. Um, but central elements to a treatment summary is obviously the underlying diagnosis uh, that a child received the transplant procedure for, any complications of the therapy, specifically listing organs that may have been impacted by the transplant procedure or infections that may have caused the problem, any surgeries are very important. Uh, the dates of the surgeries, the nature of the surgeries, even the name of the surgeons are often important. So you can go back and retrieve records, and that's very important. Uh, the details of the transplant procedure are very important. Knowing what the nature of the chemotherapy, radiation were, what kind of stem cell source, was it a cord blood, a peripheral blood stem cell, an autologous transplant, um, and the immunosuppression, all those things are extremely important. And this is something that you would uh, maintain as a life record. This is something that you would build upon. It's a permanent part of you. And as you move forward and experience new things, you want to add to refine it so that we have a current uh, picture of a patient's condition. And that assists um, all healthcare providers to provide the best um, uh, information as possible, particularly if you change doctors or if you move to another location, having an, a uh, robust treatment summary can make all the difference in the world in terms of providing um, uh, strong, uh, continuous uh, health care for a patient. So again, what should be in the treatment uh, summary? Um, they should uh, have all of the uh, late effects um, that um, Oh, well, so let me just rephrase it. So clinicians who manage uh, uh, patients with late effects can use a treatment summary to assist a patient and family to maintain their wellness. 
And so not only are the details of uh, past treatments important, but also by taking that information, by taking the current testing, we can then generate a profile of what issues are relevant to you. So if you think about the potential side effects a patient may have, it's a huge laundry list that could take up hundreds of pages. But an individual often will manifest only a handful of problems. And to be able to take that historic information and then put, make it relevant to you or your child's uh, condition into very discrete problems that have been documented and established for your child just makes it easier for both you and your clinicians to navigate through these problems. And then a ideal treatment summary also has um, an educational component. Once we identify that there are specific problems, we want to be able to provide you information in terms of how you think about these problems. And so there'll be phrases like, you know, if you have heart disease or, or let's say you've received a medicine called um, uh, Adriamycin, uh, which is often actually not used for um, transplant, but it can cause damage on the heart. So you could say because you had adriamycin, you are at risk for heart disease. And, they, and then that would follow with discussions to saying, as a consequence, you should be monitored by X. It may be echocardiograms, it may be blood tests, but there would be specific recommendations. So knowing what your particular risk factors are, we can then outline specific things that should be part of your uh, routine management. And then for you uh, as a patient or a family member, we want to make it more simple. We want to say uh, these are the signs that you should look for, and if you see these signs, you should alert your uh, clinician that, the, that you're experiencing these things, and this may be a sign that your heart's not functioning well or your thyroid's not functioning well. And so uh, those are things that we know what those signs are, and we can provide information for you to assist you. And then, uh, finally, we want you to play an active role in terms of protecting your own body. So there are things you can do to prevent uh, yourself from experiencing significant health problems, even if a particular organ may be at risk. So, again, with the example of heart disease, maintaining good, maintaining good weight, controlling your blood pressure, uh, a regular exercise program, controlling your uh, lipid profile, those would be things that would be specific for a person who is at risk for heart disease. And obviously, depending upon uh, what your particular profile looks like, those scope of recommendations would be different. But this is what a ideal treatment summary would have. It would have the historic information. It would have the documentation of the specific problems that you're experiencing, and then an educational component with each specific problem providing you with information to how to maintain your wellness as best as possible. Uh, so the treatment summary can be invaluable as a tool to keep you or your child healthy. And so you should view it as such. It's your property and it's something that you should keep updated. You should keep multiple copies so that you have them in safe places. And you can, and obviously any time that you have to go to a doctor, it should be you should bring it with you if they don't have a copy so that they can they can put it in their charts and also educate themselves in terms of what kind of problems you have. And so um, and the recommendations that we have have, at least in our treatment summaries, are, are very helpful, particularly for clinicians who may be uh, inexperienced in late effects. So you may go to a, um, move to an area in which you may not have a robust late effects program. So the treatment summary can supplement any um, limitations that you may have in your own healthcare network so that they can at least see these are the things that uh, the clinician should be doing or assisting you with to maintain uh, wellness. And so that becomes a, a really important aspect. And it, it's just another reflection of how much you as a patient or a family member need to invest in yourself, be confident in, in what you know, and to be able to advocate for your, your own wellness. Uh, last couple of topics, monitoring growth. Uh, children who, uh, grow and they go, undergo many changes. And when they receive uh, a transplant procedure, they, the growth may not go um, as planned depending upon how the transplant procedure affects them. 
And so the youngest children are, um, are most susceptible. So obviously infants are more susceptible than um, school-aged children who are um, more susceptible to than older people because they have to overcome the challenges and grow normally. And that's a, a big demand for the body to overcome, particularly if they've been impacted by the transplant procedure. So the organs grow, and so sometimes they may um, uh, do fine for a while, but suddenly show signs of failure maybe decades later after a child's procedure, and so that's important. We talked about um, uh, intellectual growth and emotional growth, and so as, as a child uh, advances through each stage of development, there are going to be new challenges, and it'd be great to say that this is the scope of problems, and, and it, it's never going to get any worse with that. But unfortunately, in a child, it's going to evolve. And problems that were initially big problems may go away, but new problems will develop. And that's just part of being a growing child. And, um, and we, should be, we should accept that and meet that challenge so that we can uh, provide the best uh, care possible for these children. So um, <clears throat> what is important in terms of maintaining good health? Regular screening tests are important. Um, we can't tell, tell uh, in particular whether someone's having a problem unless we um, uh, do what are called screening tests, which are very simple tests, often in the clinic, just to see are there early signs that there are difficulties. And so uh, we put a lot of emphasis in trying to make this as convenient for families as possible, but screening tests are very important. And once you have a screening test that shows an abnormality, it's extremely important that you follow through and get the more formal testing and any uh, interventions that's necessary. Putting off late effects only further hurts your child because of the growing issues. They need to uh, maintain their wellness, maintain optimal function of all their organs as they grow, or if, if, if the, you don't intervene at the earliest point, the child is just gonna fall further and further behind, and that makes it uh, uh, the challenge even more difficult as you move forward. Don't wait for the problems to become obvious. Um, a child may develop uh, a severe illness from some of these late effects, but then the management becomes more urgent. It may be harder to get access to services, and sometimes opportunities may, may close. Like So for instance, if a child is fully advanced in puberty and they and it's realized that the child has growth hormone uh, deficiency, um, the bones are, are already mature and, you, and the child will not be able to grow any further even if they get growth hormone supplementation. However, if you catch it early, recognize it early and implement it before the child's bones are fully matured, you have that potential to catch up. We talked about failing in class and the difficulties that, that can occur. And again, just like I had mentioned in fertility, um, trying to capitalize on opportunities to preserve fertility is important to address early because you may not have the flexibility or the opportunity to capitalize those as, as you move forward. At the end of the day, the goal is to achieve uh, independence. Um, and this goal encompasses many things. It means optimizing your health. It means optimizing your happiness. It's very important that you address the longstanding emotional strains. We realize a successful transplant is a wonderful thing, but it's not the end of the story. And um, it's, it's uh, unfortunate uh, that uh, many challenges may uh, lie in the future, but we have to accept that as, as part of uh, the process that we experienced and we have to commit ourselves to um, not um, walk away from this process and do everything possible to uh, maintain our health. Our health. Uh, optimization of education. There are um, many patients who may have specific problems because of a specific late effects that may not be able to do anything they want to as a long-term career. And so if you have a chronic back problem working in a factory line may not be an optimal situation. Or if you have vision problems, you may not have, uh, you may not be able to drive or do something that allows you to do that close, those kinds of things. So it's important that you're honest with yourself. You take the steps to um, identify your lay effects and let that mold your career goals. There are many opportunities out there to 
um, have a fulfilling life, uh, integrating um, the late effects that you have so that you aren't struggling advancing yourself into adulthood. And, and that's some of the things that we put a lot of emphasis on, particularly as the children get older, is, is to, you know, um, we know you have these problems. You can be happy and successful if you move in this direction, and we're going to help you do that. Um, because at the end of the day, you need to have uh, a stable career and job. And it's not just because of being able to maintain a certain lifestyle, but a stable job typically in, uh, reflects stable insurance. You are going to have an increasing number of health difficulties as you get older. You need to be insured so that that doesn't become an impediment for you to be able to uh, move forward. And so uh, our goal is for you to be happy, healthy, and insured. And if we achieve those three goals, then we've done our job. Um, it's never too early to start developing a strategy. Um, the, you set out a plan that invariably will be needed to tweak as, as things evolve. Um, the patient needs to be an active participant, particularly as they get older and they can understand their problems. We have to have a plan that they can embrace, that they can accept, that they're going to commit to. And so just telling people what they have to do without their buy-in is, is not a very effective strategy. And this is a lifelong commitment. Um, and so early preparation, so this becomes second nature for a growing child, is really the best strategy so that uh, acceptance of that plan can be done. Um, and and so oftentimes it's important for a, a growing child to accept more responsibility, to become form more familiar with the problems uh, that they're experiencing, and as they get older and mature, uh, play a more active role in terms of not just decision making, but, but specific active uh, steps that they do to promote their wellness. And um, adherence, um, this is all about maintaining adherence through life. But if we have adherence to life to a commitment to wellness, we'll have a very successful outcome. So in summary, uh, pediatric uh, cancer, uh, pediatric survivors of uh, hematopoietic stem cell transplant can have, a, have diverse long-term problems with varying severity, it can impact physical, intellectual, and emotional states. Treatment summaries are very important in terms of providing information for both clinicians and patient families. And families need to stay engaged with late effects clinicians to stay up to date with what's going on, but also uh, 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 stay uh, in touch with uh, how to improve their, their lives as they move forward. Again, I want to thank uh, the organizers of the symposium for having this opportunity, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Hi, this is Dr. Patel again. I just want to thank uh, Dr. Hayashi. That was a wonderful summary and overview of a of a very broad topic. You could take each one of those slides and and do a whole lecture uh, in itself on the on the various issues. So wonderful job summarizing. Um, we do have a, a couple uh, really good questions and, and uh, that sort of underpin some of the things you've talked about. Um, so I'll go ahead and uh, ask the first one. Uh, that's that's in the chat box. And if if there's any additional questions, please include them uh, in the in the comment box or in the in the chat box, please. So the the first question uh, is, uh, who can help uh, my son? And um, uh, this individual states her son is 14 years old and two and a half years post transplant. And who can help manage uh, her son's uh, yearly follow-ups. It, it seems as if uh, he has had no GVHD and is doing really well. Um, but it sounds like this mother is asking, uh, how does one uh, orchestrate this? Because it seems that this mother in particular is doing it on her, uh, what seems to be on her, her own. So how can she better help coordinate her, uh, her child's global care? Yeah, th th that unfortunately is a challenge. I, I think um, depending upon where you live and, and how um, different uh, programs are structured, uh, there can be potentially several avenues. Um, sometimes if you had a history of cancer, um, you may return to your primary oncologist and that oncologist may uh, be able to provide the coordination and support for late effects. So other programs have very specific late effects um, uh, clinics. We actually have a clinic specifically for transplant patients. 
Um, and so those are obviously more um, more uh, aligned in terms of providing those information. But at the end of the day, um, it, it, you're going to need to provide a strategy that you know works for you. So being as formed as impossible as as possible for knowing what needs to be done, and if you can't find someone to um, to, to fulfill that role, it may lie on you to do that, and uh, and um, that's an unfortunate uh, uh, answer, but that's often a common one, particularly if you move um, from region to region across the country, you'll find pretty substantial differences in terms of what services are offered. So that's why this whole process of the treatment summary and, and maintaining uh, advocacy for, for yourself and your child is very important. Yes, I would I would echo those uh, sentiments myself. It's uh, it's tough depending on where you are, and um, yeah, but you, I I would uh, say to this uh, mother as well is that she's doing the absolute right thing and 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 uh, engaging in conferences like this to find more information and advocate uh, for her son and uh, and and see who the regional uh, experts are and. Um, and continue to reach out to uh, experts and, and other venues uh, to, to see if there is a long-term survivorship uh, in your in your area. Uh, oftentimes, um, and I won't speak for uh, Dr. Hiyashi, but I imagine his wonderful clinic does this as well, is that um, referrals can be made and they can provide that initial summary and and send and send you back to your local doctors with a with a comprehensive plan. And uh, so, yeah, please continue to reach out. Uh, the second question uh, uh, in the chat box is from uh, an individual with a wonderful email address of Led Zeppelin. Uh, so unfortunately, I can't. Uh, I want to ask more questions about that, but I can't. But uh, his question is: uh, it says, "Hello, I'm a 25-year-old post-BMT patient uh, with AML. Do you think it's still good for me to have a treatment summary or to make that?" treatment summary now, given how far I am after transplant, and, and that I don't have all the specific details of what I received uh, at that time, but uh, do you think it's still a good idea to seek out a summary and have that available? Um, I, I certainly um, uh, feel that uh, if you can assemble a treatment summary to the best that you can, if your providers can help you, that that's still even at this stage an invaluable um, tool. Um, you know, even things like knowing that you had radiation or did not have radiation, or if you received um, cytoxin or not, can be very important things. Even if you don't know the specifics, it puts you in a category where we can kind of um, assemble different um, risk factors that would be specific to you. You know, as as, as you've seen, uh, the BMT Infonet has resources to kind of help you with that. Um, and I may get in trouble for this, but uh, I belong to an organization I'm on the board of an organization called the National Children's Cancer Society, who has in their website uh, Beyond the Cure, and you can put you can type in your own profile to the extent that you know it, and it will generate some information that will be relevant to you. Um, uh, in the fashion of this treatment summary that I articulate. So there are resources out there um, with many organizations. It may require more homework from you and more efforts, but to the extent that you can engage with your past providers and get some information or just, um, you know, uh, try to assemble it from your memory, uh, uh, something is better than nothing. And it, and it actually, even if it's a small amount of information, it's still pretty valuable. Wonderful. Um, there's, there's no more additional questions in the chat, but I, I do have one for my for myself as a, if I'm allowed as the moderator to ask uh, your expertise is is that where you know a couple questions in, the, in 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 summary would be where do you feel we have the most knowledge base in terms of our uh, late effects outcomes. Uh, perhaps where do you think we have the least knowledge and and, and that kind of goes with where the least knowledge is. What do you think we as a community need to work on uh, in getting better answers for our patients? In, in what sort of late effects um, outcome do you feel like we're, we're continue to struggle and we need to be better at? 
Well, I would say um, there are some areas in which uh, have been known and obvious for a long time, like thyroid disease, tech malignancies, um, in which um, you, we we know we have a lot of information and we have a pretty good sense of what's going on. I will say that even some of the conditions that we've known for many, many years, let's say conditions of the heart, we really don't have a good handle in terms of what that really entails um, because although there's been a lot of, of work studying patients, uh, uh, children who've undergone transplants, there has been, uh, it's much more difficult to do research on adults who had transplants as children. The, the patients often move. They have like this uh, one uh, person had indicated may not have access to their records. And so there's still a lot of unknowns. I will say one of the biggest challenges that we experience, and, and, it, and it's really kind of on the forefront of our particular um, interest, is, is trying to get the childhood cancer survivor to engage and take um, ownership of their health. Um, it's very easy, particularly if you consider that an adult child, uh, childhood transplant survivor may be 19 or 20, the average 19 or 20-year-old you know, has a very carefree view of the world and, and often isn't um, likely to kind of immerse themselves in some of the complexities that it often takes with regard to uh, survivorship management. So we try to make the picture simple, but we also try to our best to get the patients and families uh, to engage and that the time is now to do things to keep the, the patient as healthy as possible. And um, that's a struggle for us. I mean, people don't want to uh, consume themselves after succeeding a transplant procedure and to embarking on yet another journey. And, um, and so that, that has been a big focus of our work. Thank you, thank you. There, uh, an additional question just popped up. Uh, we do have uh, certainly some time to answer more questions. And so uh, the additional question is, uh, I'm, uh, I am 20 years old and 10 years post-transplant. I was wondering what adult secondary cancer screening should I be receiving now and in the coming years? So there, there are recommendations um, through um, this organization and other in, in organizations like the Children's Oncology Group, et cetera, that provide uh, cancer screenings. I, the comment I would make is that there are two things to consider. Number one is the time since the transplant. So as you get further out uh, from transplant, uh, conditions become less of a concern. So most leukemias caused by transplants usually occur within the first five years. Most uh, a lot of the sarcomas uh, for patients who've received radiation occur in the next uh, for 10 years after a transplant. But as you move into adulthood, your risk for cancer still persists. And we're, we're now appreciating now that it's your elevated risk for adult cancers uh, compared to the general population that appears to be a problem. So things like colon cancer, melanoma, uh, breast cancer, um, are things that children don't experience, but ch childhood survivors of, of transplant procedures do. And so um, those recommendations continue to evolve. Um, they are available on a variety of websites, and you should have uh, discussions with your provider, particularly someone who's familiar with this topic so that they can best uh, serve you well. Thank you. So with that, we're uh, nearing the end of, the, of this session. And so just a, a brief conclusion, you know, on behalf of myself, uh, BMT InfoNet, and all the partners, uh, I want to thank you, Dr. Hayashi, for taking time on your Saturday afternoon to, uh, to give us this wonderful summary, um, great remarks, great uh, answers to your questions, and, and your guidance and expertise is, is, is certainly valuable. I know... Um, uh, our patients and uh, and the patients that are on this uh, truly benefit from uh, from your comments. So uh, for those who are online, um, please click on the left, uh, or excuse me, please click on the link on the left of your screen, and you can view the other workshops taking place this afternoon. And I encourage you to uh, join them and uh, learn the most you can from this wonderful uh, symposium. So thank you again, uh, Dr. Hayashi, and and all those who attended. Thank you.